Hey guys, I'm going to attempt to redo a video again that I did on Wednesday and about 40 minutes in the video got messed up. But anyways, I'm going to talk about was Peter the first pope? And so I'm going to get into Roman Catholicism a little bit. A brother's been wanting me to do this for a while and I have as well. And maybe I've made some videos here and there about their doctrines, but... Anyways, you know, it's important. Roman Catholicism, they claim that they are the true Christian church, uh, the true church that is that Christ built. And they've been around for centuries, and there's millions or billions of Roman Catholics in the world. So it's very, very important that we understand you know, what they teach and that we see... Uh, that they're wrong. You know, one of the most, one of the worst things about Roman Catholicism is that they teach a work salvation. They teach that you have to keep these sacraments um, to be saved, to enter the kingdom of God. And so that's definitely one of the most damnable doctrines that they teach. You know, they do teach some things right, of course. They teach the Trinity. Um, that God is one, and there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But they also uh, idolize Mary and the saints, and they teach uh, false doctrine of purgatory, and many bizarre doctrines. Okay, And a lot of these doctrines, they don't even have scriptural support, or they have a verse or two that they'll take out of context. Um, but I think that the... To get to the heart of Roman Catholicism is that they teach that Peter was the first pope because they say that they are the true apostolic church. They say that Jesus handed Peter the keys to the kingdom and he was to be the head of the church and that he was to pass on these keys to his successors. And they say that there's an unbroken chain of succession, of, of handing these keys down. And um, they claim that the Pope today is, you know, is the end of that succession until he passes it on. And so, if we find out that that's false, which it is, that Peter was not the first Pope, then that cuts out the legs of the whole Roman Catholic system. So I do think it's important to go over all the doctrines like, you know, all the false doctrines that they teach about Mary, the false doctrine of purgatory, uh, point out their false gospel of works, and all this other st stuff. There's so much, but really, uh, this is one of the main things, I think, is, is show that Peter was not the first pope, and you see that the whole thing is a fraud. And so I'm not going to go over all the intric intricacies of, um, you know, quotes from Catholics and stuff saying that Peter was the first pope, there's lots more that I could go into in this study, but the main thing for me is what does the Bible say and what is their scriptural support for these claims? So there's a handful of the passages that I'm going to go over. And the main one, really, that this whole study that, you know, everything really relies on is Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 through 19, where it talks about Peter, um, where Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so the Catholics will claim that Peter is the rock and that uh, the church is, is built on him, in a sense, or that he was the head of the church. And so that's really the heart of this doctrine, which I think is the heart of Catholicism. So it all kind of relies on that passage. But there are some others that they'll go to. Jesus prayed that the faith of Peter wouldn't fail, and we'll look at that. Jesus told Peter to feed his sheep. Uh, there's something that they'll call maybe the Jerusalem Council, and uh, we see Peter in Babylon, which they will claim that Peter was in Rome, because they say that Peter was the first bishop of Rome, and so therefore he was the first pope. And, uh, and then I'm going to look over some things in Scripture that refute this idea that Peter was the first pope, and I'm sure there's much more that I could go over, but... Uh, you know, the whole Roman Catholicism, it's, it's all a fraud, and there's so much wrong with it, and it's like, they've been convincing people for years that they're the true apostolic church, so 
You know, it's like I wonder why people believe these things when it's not true from Scripture. There's there's plain Scripture, you know, that refutes it. And a lot of people are grown up in the Roman Catholic system. They're indoctrinated at a young age. And, you know, if you look online for the true Christian church and stuff, you'll see Roman Catholicism pop up all the time. So, you know, they've got all those bases covered, unfortunately. And... Uh, I can see the appeal, you know, uh, the natural fallen man, you know, we want to to do works, to be saved. We like, uh, we would like to have someone else tell us that we're forgiven of our sins. Uh, we, you know, all the gold, all the stained glass, you know, a lot of you, like me, probably watched movies growing up, seeing on TV, and movies like The Exorcist or something where you got the Roman Catholic priest and they're exercising demons, casting them out of people. And so we get this idea in our head that, you know, Roman Catholics are Christians, that they are holy, that they represent Christianity, you know, and they don't. But so anyways, let's just move on with the main point here of the study. So let's look at the main text. And um, again, I'll just say the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Peter was the first bishop of Rome and therefore the first pope, and they say that the Lord gave Peter the keys to heaven and to salvation. And so, was Peter the rock of the church? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 through 19, it reads, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, and what happened was Peter just said, or Jesus just said, you know, who do you think that I am? And let's see here, Matthew 16. Uh, where is it? Okay. Yeah, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus said, saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So... Catholics will claim that Peter was the rock. And so I want to look at two different aspects in this passage. I want to look at the rock, and I want to look at the keys of the kingdom. So first we're going to look at the rock. And I want to say that Peter nor any of the apostles claimed that Peter was the rock, or the pope, or the vicar of Christ. Okay, all these titles that they have for the pope. None of those are ever mentioned in Scripture for Peter, okay, or mentioned at all, the vicar of Christ or the Pope. And so Peter never talked about any successors to him, nor did anyone else. And that's very important, too, because that's what Catholics claim, that these keys were to be handed on to his successors. The passage does not teach that Peter is the rock spoken of, nor does it say that Jesus' church will be built on the rock and its successors. So even if they wanted to claim that Peter was the rock, then where's the mention of him having successors? There is none. So if they wanted to take it literally like that, and they want to say that Peter was the rock, then Jesus would have said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And so after Peter died, then there would be no more rock to have the church on because there's no mention of successors of Peter or any mention of successors of the rock. Okay, but the, the rock is not Peter. The rock is Christ. Paul says that Christ is the head of the church in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, and hath put all things under his feet, Jesus Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So who is the head of the church? The Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians, or Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, And he is the head of the body, speaking of Jesus Christ. The body is the church, who is the beginning. Uh, Jesus Christ is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So, clearly, clearly Christ is the head of the church. Okay, 
So the rock that the church is built on is Christ. And Peter and Paul declared that Jesus was the chief cornerstone in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Peter and the other apostles were merely layers of the foundation stone, which was Jesus. We see in Acts chapter 4, verse 11 through 12, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20. And finally, Jesus himself said that all authority was given to him both in heaven and on earth in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. So, Jesus has all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth. So, um, they would say that, the Catholics would say that, you know, the Pope has all the authority on the earth over the church, but no, it's Christ who has all authority. And, uh, you know, Jesus is the rock and all the other apostles, which is including Peter, he was just an apostle. They were the they were merely layers of the foundation stone. And so here's a little bit of a commentary going over this passage. Peter for himself and his brethren said that they were assured of our Lord's being the promised Messiah, the Son of the Living God. This is what Peter proclaimed that Jesus was the Son of the Living God. This showed that they believed Jesus to be more than man. Our Lord declared Peter to be blessed, as the teaching of God made him differ from his unbelieving countrymen. Christ added that he named him Peter in an allusion to his stability or firmness in professing the truth. The word translated rock is not the same word as Peter. Okay. So, actually, I think that Peter's name, in a way, uh, states kind of his instability, but there's a different different word endings distinguished between Peter, who is a piece of the building, and Christ, the Petra, that is the rock and foundation. And so, I guess if you go to the Greek or something, which I don't really like talking about the Greek or the Hebrew or uh, you know church history or things like that, but basically, I guess there's a when Christ says, Thou art Peter, Peter means rock, but it's more of a little stone. And uh, the word used for the rock that the church is built on is Petra, which is a little different. That's more of the, the, the foundation, uh, you know, a larger rock. And so uh, Peter said that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the rock, just like Jehovah is the rock in the Old Testament. And um, so Peter or Jesus is saying, you know, you're Peter, you're basically a man, and the church will be built on me, who is fully man and fully God, the rock. Okay, and so anyways, nothing can be more wrong than to suppose that Christ meant the person of Peter was the rock. Without doubt, Christ himself is the rock, the tried foundation of the church, and woe to him that attempts to lay any other. Peter's confession is this rock as to doctrine. If Jesus be not the Christ, those that own him are not of the church, but deceivers and deceived. And so I guess even when we look at Roman Catholic history, the Catholic Church Fathers, quote-unquote, they will, most of them, from what I understand, claim that when Jesus says the, the church is built on the, the rock that the church is built on is Peter's confession, his faith, saying that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the living God, but they still don't say that Peter himself is the rock, which, may, which Catholics today will try to claim. And so even if it was Peter's faith that Jesus is the Christ and saying that the church is built on this truth, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God, um, still that kind of leads to the same thing, that the church is built on Christ, who is the Son of God. And so let's look at the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom were not given to Peter alone. First of all, they were given to all the apostles because we can, relate, we can read in the um, parallel texts in Matthew and John, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, uh, Well, 
Anyways, Matthew chapter 18, verse 18, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he says, Whatsoever ye, speaking to all the disciples. And so when Jesus said he handed Peter the keys to the kingdom, what followed was he said, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So that that is the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom are not some literal physical keys. Okay, this is metaphorically um, as a figure of speech that he's handing them uh, this this power to to bind and to loose. And so Matthew eighteen eighteen, we see he does the same. He gives the same power to to all the all the disciples. John twenty twenty three. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. says the same thing to all the disciples. So it was not given to Peter alone, first of all. And second of all, what did Jesus mean when he said this? Well, this is very interesting that I came across this, and I really want to share this with you. So let's look at, examine a similar text in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. So by this, did God mean that Jeremiah had the power as an individual to root out or pull down nations? And the answer is no. It was the message that Jeremiah bore that had that power. And we can see in Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 7 through 10, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? We see the same language being used there. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So similar, similarly, similarly, the keys that Jesus gave to the apostles was the preaching of the gospel. Whosoever shall respond to the gospel and turn to God, their sins shall be loosed. And whoever will reject the gospel will remain bound. All pretensions of any man, either to absolve or retain men's sins, are blasphemous and absurd. None can forgive sins but God only. And we see some verses that state that Peter directs Simon to God for forgiveness of sins. Acts 8.22, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven thee. Okay, He doesn't say do these sacraments or go to a priest. He says go straight to God, ask God for forgiveness. And 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, He, Jesus, is faithful, and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess our sins to Jesus, not to a priest. Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Go straight to God. So, the rock was Christ, not Peter. The keys of the kingdom is the preaching of the gospel. Okay, so that main verse that all of Catholicism really rests on, you know, they're completely wrong about it. And so the whole thing is a fraud. But next, let's look at some other verses that they might use. Jesus prayed that the faith of Peter would not fail. In Luke chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, 
It says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, and that thy faith not fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. So now I'm going to go over commentary that kind of breaks this passage up a little bit by little bit. So first off, in verse 32, it says, But I, Jesus speaking to Peter, this is emphatic, in the consciousness of greater power than that of Satan and greater faithfulness than that of Peter. I have prayed for thee, which is Peter, is now spoken of alone as in greatest danger. Okay, not because he was chosen as the, the, the Pope of the church, but because he was the one in greatest danger, that thy faith fail not, or that it cease, that it not cease altogether. Our Lord prays not that Peter be not tried, but that his faith should not utterly fail, as was only through this prayer that Peter's faith did not fail altogether. An apostle's faith would become extinct did not Christ intercede for his own. When once thou hast turned again, or converted, Peter's sin and repentance are both implied here. Okay, And this is not a reference uh, to the experience with which Christian life usually begins. Peter has been converted in that sense. So some may say, they may use this verse to say that Peter wasn't saved yet until he repented of those sins, or that Peter lost his salvation. Neither one are true. He's simply speaking of repenting of the sin that he's going to commit. Peter was already saved. He remains saved. Establish thy brethren. The others were his brethren in weakness, hence the form chosen. Peter's prominence is recognized and the part he should take in the establishment of the church prophetically intimated. So this is the one and only proof text for the Vatican dogma of papal infallibility on the assumption that the promise given to Peter applies to all the popes as his successors, but one, this assumption can never be proved. Two, faith here as usual means personal trust in our Lord, not a system of doctrine to be believed. So yes, Catholics will use this verse to say that Jesus said, I have prayed for thee, Peter, that thy faith not fail not, that thy faith fail not. So they say that what he meant by his faith failing not was that his doctrine would be um, infallible, that he would be infallible in his, in his doctrine, teaching. Uh, so faith doesn't mean the system of doctrine in this sense. It means trusting in the Lord, personal trust in the Lord. Okay, Peter was not going to apostatize, basically, okay. So he denied the Lord with his mouth. He never denied the Lord in his heart because the Lord preserves those who have trusted in him. And so if this passage proves anything for the popes, it would prove also that they deny their Lord, that they need conversion, and they must strengthen their brethren, which is much more than history warrants and papal infallibilists would be willing to admit. And so, again, to, and to strengthen their brethren, it would mean that they're all in the same playing field, that they're all on the same level. There's not this hierarchy of um, clergy and laity. Okay, Everybody is brethren in Scripture. So, Jesus tells Peter to feed the sheep as the first pope, question mark. So, we're going to talk about Jesus telling Peter to feed his sheep. So, when Jesus prayed... For the faith of Peter, Peter he knew Peter was going to deny him, and he just prayed that, uh, you know, it just shows that the Lord preserves his saints. And he prayed that the faith of Peter would not pay, fail, that he wouldn't apostatize, and uh, has nothing to do with Pope or anything like that. It doesn't teach that at all. So, Jesus told Peter to feed his sheep in John chapter 21, verse 15 through 17. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. 
He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. So this was after Peter had already denied the Lord three times. So the Lord asked him three times, do you love me? Do you really love me? And he told him to feed his sheep. Well, this was not some special privilege bestowed upon Peter alone. It was to all the apostles and all the elders of the local churches. Because in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, we see Peter himself say to the elders, Feed the flock of God which is among you. Take the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. So this doesn't uh, prove you know, any higher authority of Peter or anything like that as the Pope. And the Apostle Paul, addressing at Miletus, the elders of the church of Ephesus, said, Acts 20 and 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So Paul told the elders to um, feed the flock just like Peter told the elders to feed the flock. And so that was nothing uh, particular to Peter. Now we have what I'm not really going to go over very much, but the Catholics might call the Jerusalem Council. They might say it was the first church council, council the first you know Catholic council where um, the apostles are together and they're speaking here. It's in Acts chapter 15, verse 6 through 29, and Peter was there. But Peter had no um, higher role there than the other apostles. In this instance, James seemed to be the one with the authority and to have the final word, not Peter. Because in Acts chapter 15, verse 19, James says, Wherefore, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So uh, James seems to be, to be the one with authority here, giving his sentence, giving his final verdict. And so that's that. There's nothing special there. Now let's talk about, was Peter in Rome? And so the Catholics will say, yes, he was the first bishop of Rome. And they might use this verse to try to, to teach that. First Peter chapter 5, verse 13 says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son. So it seems here that Peter's in Babylon, and they will say that Babylon means Rome. Uh, but there's no reason to believe that Babylon in this verse is a reference to Rome. Uh, and then here's some other reasons to uh, reject that. The church at Rome was mostly a Gentile church. Okay, Romans chapter 1, verse 13 says, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, also, even as among other other Gentiles. So Paul is speaking here to Gentiles. Paul was the apostle sent to the Gentiles, and Peter was sent to the Jews. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 says, but, but contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of circumcision was unto Peter. And uh, if Peter was the bishop of Rome which he wasn't, the statement by Paul would have been disrespect to Peter, because in Romans chapter 1, verse 11, Paul said, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. So he's talking about establishing these Gentiles in Rome, which if Peter was there, you know, um, that would be kind of a slap in the face to him. And so that you know that he's not getting his job done or something and Paul would have not preached there had Peter already been there because in Romans chapter 15 verse 20 Paul said yea so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named lest I should build upon another man's foundation and I would think that the same would be for Peter that if Paul would have already been there then he wouldn't have came there later and been you know uh, the bishop and he uh, was sent to the Jews. And so, anyways, he was in Babylon. Babylon's Babylon. Babylon is not Rome. So let's just look at some of these facts from uh, 
that will kind of refute also this idea that Peter was the first pope. And I want to go over these a little bit more quickly, just to hopefully get this video done before something crashes anyways. But we got Peter was never in Rome, okay? And basically there was there's no biblical evidence, no historical evidence that Peter was ever in Rome. And uh, there might be, you know, a few uh, resources that Catholics might use or something. You know, I've read in one of my Dave Hunt books, he says that there was a church history guy who said that, you know, Peter was crucified in Rome or something. And even if Peter was crucified in Rome, that still doesn't prove that he was the bishop of Rome. It doesn't prove that he was the pope or um, the vicar of Christ or anything like they say. And uh, But it's really questionable that he was even crucified in Rome, first of all. So there's not really any evidence whatsoever that Peter was in Rome or that he was the bishop of Rome. And from all the scriptures that I've read, uh, you know, it really it goes they go against that. So also, Peter was rebuked by Paul, the son and the father. So, you know, he wasn't infallible in his doctrine and he was rebuked plenty of times. Also, uh, Peter was married. OK, so Catholic Church says that the, the popes are to remain celibate. Uh, Peter was not superior to any of the other apostles. Uh, Peter refused reverence, and today we see people coming up and bowing to the Pope, kissing his ring, and uh, Peter denied the Lord three times. So I can look at some of these, and I just want to go over them. First of all, Peter was never in Rome. I already kind of went over that. Paul rebuked Peter. Uh, they say that Peter... Uh, that the Pope is above all other clergy and authority and infallible. But we read in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, that Paul withstood uh, Peter to the face. And he said, Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? The Lord rebuked Peter multiple times. He was rebuked for having little faith in Matthew chapter 14, verse 24 through 31. Um, when the Lord was walking on the water, and you know Peter tried to walk to him, and then he was afraid of drowning, and the Lord said, you know, "O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt?" And then uh, Peter was rebuked for rebuking Christ in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 through 23. Uh, he told him, you know, he didn't want him to be killed, and he told him, you know, told the Lord that this wasn't going to happen. And the Lord said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest the things that be, savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. He was rebuked by the Lord for his curiosity when he asked, um, in John chapter 21, 20 through 22, Peter turning about seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, following which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. So he's rebuked. He's rebuked for sleeping and not watching in Matthew chapter 26, verse 37 through 43. He's rebuked for cutting off the high priest's ear in Matthew chapter 26, verse 46 through 52. He's rebuked by God the Father uh, in Matthew chapter 17, verse 4 through 5, um, when he's seen Peter or Moses and Elijah with uh, the Lord. And it says, Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, the voice of the, the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So Peter kind of put Moses and Elijah and the Lord all on the same level, and uh, talking about servicing all three of them equally, in a sense. And uh, the Father says, Follow my Son, Jesus. And so Peter was married. According to Catholics, celibacy is a superior spiritual condition, and priests, nuns, and popes are all to remain celibate. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 reads, And when Jesus 
was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid in sick of a fever. So Peter was married. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, we read, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas, which is Peter? So again, showing that he has a wife. If uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 wasn't clear enough for you. But also interesting to note is that Paul does not condemn bishops having wives. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 says, A bishop must, or a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, at to teach. I don't think that this means that a bishop must have a wife. We know that Paul himself didn't have a wife. I like to think of this as a kind of anti-polygamy passage. The husband of one wife, not many. Uh, but, you know, either way that you look at it, in this instance, uh, Paul does not condemn bishops having wives, which the Catholic Church does. And so Peter was not superior to the other apostles, and we can see this in many ways. Peter was just one of the twelve apostles when they're they're named, you know, they're the twelve apostles, not the eleven possible not the eleven apostles and the one vicar of Christ or the one pope. Okay? Twelve apostles. Peter was one of them. He's one of the twelve disciples. Peter was one, just one of the three close friends of Jesus. Um, in Matthew 17, 1. Let's see, Matthew 17, 1 says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And uh, there's another passage, Matthew 26, 36 through 37. Peter, along with the other apostles, were to sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. So, again, Peter has no higher position than any of the other disciples, the apostles. Peter was sent by other apostles. In Acts chapter 8, verse 14. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Apostles sent out Peter and John. Okay, Today, the Pope would send people out, not be sent out by others. Uh, Paul did not see Peter as higher than him in authority. Paul claimed to be equal with the apostles. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, Paul said, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. And Paul himself said not to, or Peter himself said not to lord over the flock of God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being end samples to the flock. And some things that Jesus said about being the greatest in the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 18, verse 1 through 4, we see Jesus asks, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he says, whosoever, shall, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say that Peter is the, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and to, to follow him. All right. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 28 we see Jesus called unto them, unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they are great and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be the greatest among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So today we see the Pope lives in Vatican City, you know, and all this in this luxurious place with all this luxurious stuff. And Jesus says, whoever is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, let them be your servant as, as he was. Totally not how we see the Pope. Matthew chapter 23, verse 1 through 10, we see uh, Jesus says, you know, one is your master, even Christ, and you and all ye are brethren. There's one master who is Christ. Everyone else is brethren on the same level here. Jesus in John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. All on equal level. We see that 
Peter refused reverence in Acts chapter 10, verse 25 and 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And like I said, today we got people bowing down to the Pope, kissing his ring and everything else. And Peter denied the Lord Jesus three times. Uh, so he wasn't uh, infallible or, uh, you know, he definitely made error. But, you know, there's no reason whatsoever to believe that Peter was the first bishop of Rome, that he's the Pope. Uh, I want to go more into the teachings of the Pope itself and, and all the doctrines that go along with it. So this is just looking at these verses, just talking about Peter being the first Pope and refuting that. But yeah, it's, it's just not there. The Catholic Church is a fraud, and uh, they twist the Scripture, you know, they rest the Scriptures to their own demise, their own destruction, and uh, that's that. So I think I just want to finish this video up. I'm about 40 minutes in to where <laughs> I was around last time, so let's get this finished. Dear God, thank you for this study. I pray that maybe that uh, some Catholics will see this, and they'll think about this, and they'll search you out and study the scriptures, God, that they'll turn to you and trust in you and not their own works, not the sacraments, not the Pope. They'll see that the Catholic Church is a fraud, God. They'll, they'll think about this, um, you know, the context of these passages and really look it over. And uh, I pray that you bless each and every one of the people who watch this video, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And help us to serve you better and to thank of you and to thank you for everything we do, Lord, everything that that we have. And um, just thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So that's that. So I want to work more on the deity of Christ, but I would like to go into the other Catholic doctrines and stuff as well. But we'll see. But I'm glad I got this done. Like I said, I think this is kind of the heart of Catholicism. You know, take this out, and and what have they got? So it's uh, a fraud from the beginning. So thanks for watching, and God bless.